So hi guys, I hope you're all well during this extended unexpected recess. And today we're going to be looking at complex numbers. Some of us started this and uh, yeah, so it's a really interesting new section, not in the grade 12 syllabus. So new stuff, always exciting, always uh, interesting and entertaining. So yeah, um, if you're having a look at things like if I wanted, for instance, what is the square root of minus one? Your teacher would have told you, oops, don't go there. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to go just there and look at the square root of negative numbers. That's pretty cool. So hold on to your seats and let's go forth. As a physicist, I'm always interested in linking mathematics to the real world. Otherwise, what's the point of actually studying it? You know, a mathematical exercise is always going to be easy. So, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of a story and these stories, you know, they're quickly going out of existence as the older, more intelligent folk uh, leave academia or the planet itself. And, uh, you know, there's Dirac, uh, Paul Dirac, the uh, famous physicist who was attempting to work out the energy states of uh, spinning particles or spinos and ended up with having to take the square root of a negative quantity. And so the story goes and as a result was showing something like these roots of negative energies or these virtual energies should exist. And uh, years later, it was discovered by Anderson, chappy over here, that this form of matter called antimatter exists and here's a good example in the picture on the uh, left, the trajectory of a positive. Now, this is interesting. Positive electron as it travels through a cloud chamber. And you notice that if I had to ask you to guess, um, did the positron, which is a positive electron, did it travel from top to bottom or from the top, uh, from the bottom to top and why. So the trajectory of this particle very simply is actually from top to bottom. It have moved along here. And the reason for that is, you know, there's more curvature on this path here. It means when the particle hits the plate, it slows down and then curves more its radius of curvature. So some really interesting things apart from just looking at this stuff mathematically. And this is when, you know, the mathematics really becomes interesting when you start to connect those equations, those symbols to, to real life stuff. And so think about it, hey, we're speaking of a positive electron. So the big question is, does a negative proton exist? And what about a neutron? Ha, really exciting stuff, guys. You'd also find complex numbers being used a lot in describing wave phenomena. Now, just not the ordinary waves that you see like tsunamis and there's uh, stuff or waves on a string, but if you look at something in quantum physics or what we call the wave function, you know, particles like the electrons, they can actually behave as waves. And, and this is not science fiction, guys. We have electron microscopes which use the wave nature of electrons to take images, and it's astounding. And the picture on the right here, if you have a look here, is the hydrogen wave function. So if you look at the hydrogen atom itself, which is composed of a single proton with an electron orbiting, I mean, that can actually be represented by a, a wave function or the wave model of the atom, which your teacher briefly um, sort of uh, alluded to in school. But this is really the stuff of chemistry, physics, engineering, and the like. So wave phenomena, complex numbers, absolutely important. Okay, so just remind you, you know, going way back to grade six, you were introduced to the number line or even earlier than that, and that you said there was the zero and to the right of zero, all the positive numbers of integers and to the left, you had negative integers. Somewhere in between, you had the fractions, you had the irrational numbers, you had the rational numbers, uh, all of that. And suddenly, you know, we come to something called the complex numbers. Now, simply, and if I had to ask you to solve x squared minus one equals zero, very simply, you would say something like x plus 1 into x minus 1 equals 0. So you'd have come down to something like x equal to plus or minus 1. Test that, and it is a solution. But what about something like x squared plus 1 equal to 0 plus? Hmm, now we can't factorize this. And if we did something like we, we did when we were in grade R, depending on school we went to, minus one, then you're going to say something like x is equal to the square root of minus one. And you just said, no, don't go there. 
and this is precisely where we want to go and that is we're going to define the square root of minus one in this case it's going to be plus or minus this quantity called j j uh, not j as in jz but j now you'll find that some textbooks will refer to the complex uh, part as i rather than j and that is purely notation so what we've just shown is that the square root of minus one we will take as plus or minus j all right so what we're going to start doing now is to represent a complex number and with the first form is what we call rectangular form the symbol we use for the complex number is z, z and it's of the form a plus jb that form over there so the complex number in rectangular form would have a plus jb and interestingly enough a itself is referred to as the real part of z and that is a and this one the imaginary part imaginary part of z is not jb no the coefficient of j which is b so the real part of z here is a the imaginary part of z is b a nice way of actually write, writing this you find a lot of books doing that real part of z is a the imaginary part of z is b very simple simple notation nothing confusing and uh, yeah can't wait for the next slide well let's look at a very simple example so i give you a number z is equal to one minus j what is the real part of z well the real part of z is just the number one that you see sitting in front the imaginary part of z is the coefficient of j which is minus one right straightforward let's try another example knock yourself out so z is equal to 2 minus j root 3 again real part of z is what 2 imaginary part of z is minus root 3 so that was pretty straightforward okay how about something like z equal to 1 over j how do you find the real and imaginary part parts of this number over here well very simply what we can do is say right z equal to 1 over j times j over j j times j j times 1 is j j times j in the denominator is minus so this is actually minus j so the real part of that number 1 over j is actually 0 there's no real part there and the imaginary part uh, z is going to be minus 1 easy peasy okay so this is a very very important concept you've come across the word conjugate um, in school when you spoke about acids and bases you know conjugate acid base pair pair differs by one hydrogen atom if I remember correctly so the complex conjugate uh, so if you have a complex number z of the form a plus j b then its complex conjugate z bar is written as a minus j b this is important right so z equal to a plus j b the complex conjugate will be z bar which is a minus j b as an example very simple example so if i took a number z equals to 2 minus j b its complex conjugate there would be 2 plus j b not even sure why there was a b there would be is just a real number so there we go we just changed the sign simple as that we're not multiplying throughout by j we're just changing the sign cool stuff okay here's something really really simple and uh, interesting as well there's a little questions that pop up all the time so if i gave you a number z equals to one over one minus j how do you find the real part 
how do you find the imaginary part of this number over here? 1 over 1 minus j. So you've got to write it in the form. Re remember, we've got to write it in the form z equal to a plus jb. The problem is that j at the bottom. So when you're faced with something, then you write this as 1 over 1 minus j, and you multiply by the conjugate top and bottom, 1 plus j all over 1 plus j. So the top we have 1 into 1 plus j. Now here you've got to be very, very careful. People get this wrong all the time. It looks like a difference of two squares, 1 minus j into 1 plus j. It really it is. So this, but this just use the distributive law. So 1 times 1 is 1. Minus j times 1 is minus j. j times uh, 1 there is plus j. And the minus times a plus is a minus. And then you're going to get j dot j. So this becomes 1 plus j. The minus j and plus j cancel out. Yes, we see that. Gone. So what we're left with is 1. Now it almost seems, but j times j is minus 1. So we're left with 1 plus j all over 2. So this number can be written as a half plus j over 2. So what's the real part of j? The real part of, uh, sorry, z is going to be half, which is this half over here. And the imaginary part of z is also going to be half, which is 1 over 2. This is really cool, eh? Complex? No. <laughs> Get it? Yeah. So, okay, guys, here's a really neat way of representing a complex number. You know, we, we look at points um, in a Cartesian system. So how do we represent a complex number of the form z equals to a plus jb, where a and b are just real numbers? And it's actually due to a guy called Argand. And um, this guy was actually a bookkeeper who had a real interest in uh, mathematics, so not even a PhD, you know. I always ask myself, so well, how do you differentiate between a mathematician, a maths teacher, and someone just mildly interested in mathematics? Very interesting, yeah, hey? So what he did was he got together, which we're familiar with uh, the axes, as you see here. But interestingly enough, the horizontal axis belongs to the real part of Z. And the imaginary part up there, basically, should be a straight line, should... Um, belong to the imaginary part of Z, which is B that we see over here. So let's try and have a look at how we plot these numbers and what we can take from that. And I think it's very, very important moving on to the next form of the complex number. Okay, guys, so let's quickly look at a very simple example how to represent a um, sort of complex number on an argon diagram, so I'm going to take a very simple one, 1 plus j. So you notice that uh, the real part of z is 1 and the imaginary part of z is 1. And if, uh, what we recall from the last slide, the horizontal axis belongs to the real part of z and the vertical axis to the imaginary part of z. So if you look here, z, the real part is 1, so we're just going to 1 there, and the imaginary part there is 1. And so we can plot a vector, that's what I like to call it, a vector, pointing in that direction. And then the natural question to ask is, what is the length of that vector? The length of the vector, or what we call the magnitude, is just imaginary, a real part squared plus the imaginary part squared, and that becomes root 2. So this is z magnitude, which is root 2, the length of the vector. So there's a representation of z equal to 1 plus j. Easy peasy and straightforward. Right, let's try another one. Z equal to, say, 2 minus uh, j root 3. So again, the real part, the horizontal axis, imaginary part to the vertical axis. So we know that the real part is 2, so we're going to take 2 units over there. And that's 0, by the way. And then it's minus root 3. Minus root 3, if I recall, I think it's 1.73 negative. I just check that with your calculators. So that should be sitting somewhere down there. Minus root 3. And so this vector would be sitting somewhere here. And we draw that, obviously, using a ruler. It'll be straight. And the length of that vector is going to be 2 squared. And I like to include the minus sign there. Just be careful over here. Root 3 squared is not 9. 
root 3 squared is 3, 2 squared is 4, so that becomes root 7. Please check that. So the length of that line is going to be root 7. Nothing difficult here. It's pretty straightforward. All right. Create a few examples on your own. Maybe try something like minus 1, minus um, j root 2. Plot that and try to uh, establish for each of the quadrants different uh, forms of z. And um, yeah, knock yourself out. Now there must be something that you really want to ask. Let's just go to z. Let's go to the first example that we can use. 1 plus j. We know straight away there's 1. And this is the real part. That's the imaginary part. That's 1 over there. So we know the our vector was sitting in the first quadrant roughly there. Okay, so you can see straight away with that, okay, the length of z is just going to be uh, obviously root 2. It's pretty straightforward. But you can see straight away here that there's an angle associated with this vector theta. So in our next lecture, we're going to have a look at this angle theta, and we're going to use the angle theta to help us represent z in what we call exponential form, which is absolutely important. Uh, when dealing with complex numbers. Not only important, but very, very useful. So I can't wait to see you on the other side of this lecture. All right, cool stuff. So, okay, guys, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, um, you know, like, share, comment. Uh, I think, you know, during these uh, dark times, uh, we need to share information and have this hunger for learning. Just not a need because there's an exam or a chess coming up at the end of the semester, but you know, wanting a genuine wanting to learn and forge ahead and help our civilization. I think this is pretty awesome. So can't wait to share the series of videos. Uh, so yeah, hit the subscribe button and uh, yeah, get your friends to watch. Um, not just your friends, uh, go back to school, uh, maybe um, get your teachers to in actually engage with these videos as well. Uh, we're all learning, and I think um, there's no end to learning. So, yeah, so hope this is a, a genuine start to a, a really awesome journey for us. Uh, we, I've always said this. We put man on the moon. I'm sure we'll come out of this um, quite soon. So hold on to your seats, your books, your laptops, your cell phones, and your brain. See you on the other side of this.